On today's episode, I will go over an updated look at the Patrick Kane trade with the New York Rangers getting eliminated, and I'll also go over Jared Tenorti's season recap segment. All that and plenty more right here on Locked On Blackhawks. Your Locked On Blackhawks, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Today is Wednesday, May 3rd. I'm your host, Jack Bushman. You can find me out on Twitter at Jack Bushman2, or you could also go and check out my Strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey for all of the latest Blackhawks news and updates. And real quick, just a reminder that you could subscribe or follow for free on YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcast, make sure to do that real quick so that you can get the latest episode as soon as it comes out each and every day. And I just wanted to remind you all that today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Make sure to go and download the Game Time app to get the cheapest tickets for all the sports, music, and theater events near you. All right, good morning, everyone. As always, thank you all for joining me on another episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, your one-stop shop for all things Chicago Blackhawks. Thank you all for making the show your very first listen here to start off your day. Hope everyone's Wednesdays are treating them well so far. To open up things on the show here this morning, I figured with the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs wrapping up just a couple of days ago, it would be a great time to go over all the chaos that ensued in this opening round. Per usual, the Stanley Cup playoffs, they never, never fail to disappoint never fail to uh, be incredibly intriguing. I mean, so many great first round matchups, so many back and forth battles, game sevens, lots of upsets. The Boston Bruins, of course, went down. The New York Rangers go down, which impacted the Blackhawks. I'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Um, Of course, the defending Stanley Cup champion Colorado Avalanche have been already knocked out. So it's going to be an intriguing rest of the Stanley Cup playoffs because of the teams still available, none of them have won the Stanley Cup since 2006. It really feels like the new era of the NHL has officially cemented itself after the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. We're not seeing the old teams that were used to making, you know, long postseason pushes like the Tampa Bay Lightning, who made three straight Stanley Cups. They're out in the first round this year. The Boston Bruins of course, had the best regular season in NHL history. They're used to making long runs in the postseason. They get bounced. The New York Rangers won two game sevens last year. They get bounced. The Colorado Avalanche, of course, well, I think they lose five or six games in the Stanley Cup playoffs all last year. They get bounced in the first round. So, yeah, it really just feels like the new era of the NHL talent has officially arrived on the scene in these Stanley Cup playoffs. And, Very interesting to see uh, a lot of underdogs come out on top in the first round and a lot of teams that uh, some folks had counted out are still alive here as round two officially got underway last night. But I figured I'd kind of break down all of these series real quick, talk about my predictions and what kind of surprised me the most from each one of these series. I'll start off in the Western Conference. The Vegas Golden Knights defeated the Winnipeg Jets in five games. That's actually exactly how I had it personally. Winnipeg just, they they never could really find their groove, particularly in the final couple games of that series after they suffered a heartbreaking loss in game three in overtime. They marched all the way back from down four to one in the third period to force overtime. Vegas still winds up potting, finding a way to pot the game winning goal, though. They win that one five four in overtime. That basically... Um, was was the turning point of the series once Vegas went ahead two to one. They absolutely roared, roared past Winnipeg the rest of the way to get into the second round. We also saw the Dallas Stars defeat the Minnesota Wild in six games. I have the Stars making it all the way to the Western Conference Finals. So this was a pretty good pick for me, starting two and O. Oh. And for Minnesota, ugh, as a city, their playoff woes continue. I apologize to my boy Seth Topal from Lockdown Wild if he's hearing this. The Minnesota sports curse lives on as the Wild get bounced in the first round. Once again, they scored three goals in the final three games of this series. Had a real big problem 
with Dallas Stars goaltender Jake Ottinger, who sadly the Blackhawks passed on a few years ago in the NHL draft. He even spoke recently, I think it was his father actually, who spoke about how uh, the they thought as a family that Jake was going to get drafted by the Blackhawks. They end up taking Henry Yoki Haru. That's a story for a whole nother day. But Ottinger was tremendous all series long. Dallas really rode him without Joe Pavelski at the end of that series. They still find a way to come back and uh, defeat the Wild in six games with a really strong showing in the final three of that series. Then we also saw the Edmonton Oilers defeat the Los Angeles Kings once again for the second consecutive year. They met up in the first round. Edmonton got the job done in overtime of Game 7 last year. This time, it only took them six games to defeat the Los Angeles Kings. And the turning point for me in this series was game four. Los Angeles had a two to one lead in the series and a three nothing lead after the first period in game four. The Edmonton Oilers come storming back to tie the game. They wind up winning it with a Zach Hyman game winner in overtime. The rest of the series ends up going their way. They close out the final three. Edmonton now has a date with the Vegas Golden Knights in the second round. I have Edmonton, of course, making it all the way to the Stanley Cup and with Colorado getting bounced. I know there are a lot of competitive teams still alive in the Western Conference. Don't get me wrong. I think any of the four still around can represent the Western Conference in the Stanley Cup final. But I do think Colorado getting bounced certainly helps the Edmonton Oilers out. Very intriguing second round matchup with the Vegas Golden Knights that starts here this evening. And then the final series in the Western Conference may have been the best one. Seattle and Colorado goes to seven games and how about the Kraken in their second year as an expansion team defeating the Stanley Cup champion Avalanche in seven games? And what an impressive fashion they did it in, folks. I mean, going into Colorado and winning both games five and game seven on the road, backs against the wall, they won both of them. Seattle is just such a scrappy and tenacious team. I mean, so hardworking along the boards. They never stop in. We saw that again last night in game one of their second round series with the Dallas Stars where Yanni Gord scored the overtime winner. Seattle, man, they look to be an absolute problem just the way they play the game, the physicality and size they have on defense. And Philip Grubauer standing on his head right now, so don't count out the Kraken, folks. Very good second round series with Dallas. It was an awesome game one. Joe Pavelski returned for the Stars and scored four goals. Uh, an incredible series. This was the only one I got wrong in the Western Conference. I had Vegas, I had Dallas, I had Edmonton, I had Colorado in six. I want to say Seattle shocks not everyone, but a lot of people by upsetting the champs and moving on to the second round. Then getting over to the Eastern Conference, we got to start with the Florida Panthers and the Boston Bruins. Boston, what are you doing? In classic Cleveland Indians, Detroit Red Wings style, they blow a 3-1 to one series lead. They lose games 5 and game 7 on home ice after being historically incredible at home in the regular season. I already mentioned the best regular season in NHL history, an absolutely loaded roster. Look, I know that uh, Linus Olmark was injured and Patrice Bergeron was injured, but if you look at this roster on paper, they're still deep enough where they should have got the job done. I mean, for Christ's sake, Taylor Hall's won the Hart Trophy before, and he's playing on their third line. It was an absolutely loaded Bruins squad, but how about the comeback Cats? I mean, they've kind of been dubbed that the last couple of years, but this group, their willingness to fight when their backs are against the wall is nothing short of incredible. They come, come back from 3-1 in the series. They also come back in Game 7 after blowing a 2-1 to -one lead Brandon Montour, who's just been massive for them, scores the game-time goal with a minute left. They go on to win Game 7 in overtime. An unbelievable choke job from the Boston Bruins. I had them going all the way to the conference final, but I'm not mad about it. Very happy for my boy Armando Velez from Lockdown Panthers as they get the job done in Game 7. They also picked up an epic Game 1 win in the second round over the Toronto Maple Leafs last night, who did finally slay the demon and got past the Tampa Bay Lightning in the first round of the playoffs. And it took everything they had because in the later stages of those series, all of these games were super close, but I think the turning point or not really the turning point, the deciding factor 
was Tampa Bay won all three games that went into overtime. They had the clutch factor and the finishing touch. They scored the important goals in this series. That's what it's going to take to finally get over the hump and get into the second round. First time since 1994, I believe, that the Leafs are in the second round. Unbelievable. I had Tampa winning this game in seven series. I just could in seven games, excuse me. I just couldn't pick the Leafs because I had seen this movie too many times, but I am happy for that group that they finally get over the hurdle, but they still have their hands full with the Florida Panthers in the second round. They picked up an impressive game one victory up in Toronto last night. Then the Carolina Hurricanes defeated the New York Islanders in six games. This was honestly my least favorite series of the bunch. There was no offense. Everyone was hurt. Uh, Carolina super banged up, which I think kind of screws them for their second round series. I had Carolina winning this game in six games. I just knew the Islanders couldn't score enough, but this series really is the one of the only one of the bunch that kind of was putting me to sleep. And then the last series, the one that impacts the Blackhawks the most, the New Jersey Devils shock everyone and defeat the absolutely star loaded New York Rangers in seven games. And I'll tell you what, it just never worked for the Rangers. Those deadline acquisitions, it just never worked. They never found the chemistry up front in that forward group. Sure, they had Igor Shosturkin doing everything he could in that to back them up. But offensively, what a flop by the New York Rangers in this series. In the in <clears throat> excuse me, an unacceptable shutout loss on the road in Game 7. I get it's on the road, but you got to find a way to score a goal in Game 7. And in Games 3, 4, 5, and 7 combined, the Rangers mustered up two goals. I don't know why I put up four. Four games, two goals. Akira Schmidt for the Devils. What a performance from the 22-year-old. He really, I mean, the Devils just played with so much speed. I can't really say that Akira Schmidt carried them into the second round, but he really shut the door on the Rangers after they rolled through the Devils in the first two games. New Jersey winds up clawing back and winning this series in seven games. Sad that Patrick Kane gets traded to the New York Rangers for that. Such a lackluster performance from everyone really on that team in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Kaner didn't really look all that great after game two. He was kind of decent in game seven. One of the Rangers' better players, Tarasenko, was absent. Alexi Lafreniere put up goose eggs all series, number one overall pick. Artemi Panarin had one five-on-five five point in the series. He really needs to figure it out, and I'm not trying to call Artemi Panarin, but he's been way too quiet in the Stanley Cup playoffs since becoming a member of the New York Rangers, and for the money that he's getting paid, he's got to start showing up when it matters the most because in the playoffs, he's been a ghost, and it happened again this year, and the Rangers wind up getting bounced, and with the New York Rangers getting eliminated in the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs and not reaching the Eastern Conference Final, the Blackhawks officially receive the New York Rangers 2023 second round pick, which now gives them four second round picks in the 2023 NHL draft. They also have six picks inside the first two rounds, and there could be more coming if we've learned anything uh, from Kyle Davidson's first draft as a general manager. The Blackhawks have an ample amount of cap space. I expect Kyle Davidson to be very aggressive with that cap space to try to take on other bad contracts and get assets as part of those deals. So there's an update from the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. The Blackhawks do not get their third first round pick. Sadly, a tough way for the New York Rangers season to come to a close. Patrick Kane, is he going to wind up back in New York next season? I'm not really sure. I'm going to save that conversation for an entire segment but there are my thoughts on a chaotic first round of the 2023 Stanley Cup playoffs. Coming up in just a moment, I will get into a quick preview of the Ice Hogs pivotal game three against the Texas Stars tonight. But first, I need to talk to you all about game time, which is the perfect place for last minute ticket deals. Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful, and game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. And I've actually been using Game Time since well before they were an ad for the show. That's no lie. I used Game Time when I was in high school, when I was in college, when I went to University of Missouri. I use them to go to St. Louis Cardinals games all the time just because I'm a fan of sports and they were cheap and I wanted to go. That's an honest to God true story. Game Time 
it is the best place and the cheapest place for you to purchase your tickets. I also love how they give me images of my seats along with event cancellation protection. So go and download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the promo code LOCKDOWNNHL in all caps for $20 off your first purchase. Again, all you have to do is create an account and redeem the code LOCKDOWNNHL in all caps for $20 off. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed, Game Time. All right, we're back here on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Before I get into segment two real quick, I do want to let you all know about the awesome stuff that I have planned for Lockdown Blackhawks here in the offseason. Of course, I've already uh, begun my 2022-2023 season recaps. I've already gone over Connor Murphy, Andreas Athanasiu, Seth Jones, Tyler Johnson, and Jason Dickinson. So if you haven't seen all of those season recap segments yet, make sure to go and click on the channel to check them out. I also just had Joey Anderson, Blackhawks trade deadline acquisition and current Rockford Icehawks forward on the show yesterday. Make sure to go and click on the channel to watch that interview. Also talked with Alec Regula and Ryder Rolston recently as well. I had an off-season chat with NBC Sports Chicago's Charlie Rumeli Otis. I also am planning on having a similar discussion with WGN's Joe Brand here in the next couple of weeks. And then we're just five days away from the 2023 NHL Draft Lottery, folks. So starting up soon, I'll be getting into NHL Draft profiles. I'll also take a look at some potential free agent finds and fits for the Blackhawks. And I can't forget about my end of the season top 10 Blackhawks. Blackhawks top 10 prospects list, excuse me. So lots of good stuff coming here on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast. I know this is usually the slow time of the season, but that's not the case here on Lockdown Blackhawks. Make sure to go and subscribe to the YouTube channel to stay all caught up on that good stuff. All right, segment two, I did want to talk for a moment about the monumental matchup tonight down in Texas between the Rockford Ice Hogs and the Stars as the series shifts down south. And the Ice Hogs are, of course, in quite the predicament. They dropped both games on home ice over the weekend, losing game one on Friday, game two on Sunday. And they now trail two to nothing in the series as they head to Dallas. They'll need to win all three games on the road in order to keep their Calder Cup playoff hopes alive. And it starts with a do or die game three here this evening in Texas. But as I talked about with Joey Anderson a couple of days ago, both of these games were super close and were super tight and came down to the wire. Like I know if you go and look at the score game two, it says the final score was four to one, but that was a two to one game with under four minutes to go. So the ice hogs, despite not coming out with the win in either of the first two games, they've been right there in both of them. And I also think they haven't even sniffed their best hockey as of yet. So those are some things that while it hasn't gone their way so far, there is certainly an opportunity for them to bounce back here tonight. This was a team that they won uh, five of the eight meetings against in the regular season. So they just got to get off to a better start. There are a couple of key things that I think they can do in order to get the job done here tonight. Um, but it's a must win or else the season's over. That's the name of the game when it's playoff time. And Rockford is in their first real test here of the 2023 Calder Cup playoffs. Here are a couple of the things that I think they need to do in order to get the ship back on track this evening. The first and most important thing to me Kind of a two-parter here. Lucas Reichel needs to be a game-breaker. He's got no points in four playoff games so far. And look, I know he's playing on the top line with Joey Anderson and Rocco Grimaldi. Didn't get a lot of time with either of those two guys in the regular season. Is still, I'm sure, kind of figuring out exactly how they like to play and whatnot. Joey Anderson kind of talked through that a little bit as well. Um, but make no mistake about it, Lucas Reichel has to be the best player for the Rockford Ice Hogs, or one of the best in He's been a ghost so far this series. We heard Anders Sorensen call him out after game one. Didn't get much of a better performance out of him in game two. Lucas Reichel needs to be the man tonight for the Ice Hogs in order for them to have the have a chance. And that goes for the entire top line. Joey Anderson does have goals in back-to-back -back games, but that top line just has not been effective. Not a lot of offensive zone cycle time when they have uh when they have a shift together out there on the ice. So really think that needs to happen for the Ice Hogs tonight to pick up a big win 
in game three. And I also think the second line of David Gus, Brett Sini, and Luke Phil need to be, you know, the veteran anchors of this team. I thought they did a really good job kind of carrying the pace and setting the tone in the playing series against Iowa. That just hasn't been true so far here against Texas. They need those veterans who have been there and done that to lead by example right now. Look, Texas is playing a game where they're going to stand you up at the blue line, the red line, and they're going to make you dump it in and go and win battles to go and get it back. I think this second line really needs to show that they can do that to get the rest of the group rolling. And then three, the bottom six has been tremendous for Rockford, especially the third line of Tepley, Busteeker, and Buddy Robinson. They've been awesome. If they can get the top six going and continued energy from the bottom six whenever they get a shift, I think that'll go a long way for the Ice Hogs as well. Really liked what I've seen out of Jalen Lipen on the fourth line so far too. Uh, I also think letting Arvid Soderbloom do his thing, don't make life difficult for him. He's a very confident and comfortable postseason goalie. He's really been good in every postseason series he's played so far in his young career. Make life easy for Arvid Soderbloom. Don't take a lot of penalties. Don't be screening him because if he's seeing it, he's probably going to come up with the save. And then last but certainly not least, I think it's very important for the Ice Hogs to score first. They've trailed, um, that they've allowed Texas to score the opening goal in both games of the series so far. Look, I know it's kind of a cliche hockey thing to say, right, score first, but I think that does go a long way for them. And a winner go home game three, if they get off to a lead, they don't have to be squeezing the stick so hard and fighting from behind the whole time. I think it would make them a little bit more comfortable if they can wind up finding the back of the net first. So those are all of my keys for the Rockford Ice Hogs to pick up a massive win in a pivotal game three tonight as the series shifts down to Texas. All right, before I wrap up today's show, I still have to get into my next Blackhawks season recap segment. And as I mentioned a moment ago, for those who have missed it, I've already gone through several Blackhawks season recaps already. Seth Jones, Connor Murphy, Andreas Athanasiu. If you want to get all caught up on the season recap segment, all you have to do is go and click on the YouTube channel, hit the videos at the top. Everything's time coded in the description of each video. So you can quickly jump through all of the segments and get all caught up on my season recaps. And while you're there, if you haven't done so already, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. I greatly appreciate all of the support. All right, without further ado, up next, we have 31-year-old defenseman Jared Tenorti, who was claimed off of waivers by the Blackhawks from, wow, why am I, I believe it was the New York Rangers, funny enough. Maybe we get Jared Tenorti's part of the Patrick Kane trade. Just kidding. Um, but when the Blackhawks first claimed Jared Tenorti off of waivers right before the season started, I was kind of befuzzled. Didn't really understand it because, well, you know, Alex Vlasic was a guy that got some NHL time at the end of the season prior. He looks pretty good. I wonder if they want to have Isaac Phillips come up in the NHL or Jakob Galvis. They have a new guy here in Philip Ruse. Caleb Jones is back. Ian Mitchell is supposed to get a big opportunity. Jack Johnson was brought in. So when Tenorti was claimed off of waivers, I didn't really get it. And I didn't understand exactly how he was going to fit in. But once it became abundantly more clear that the Blackhawks were going to be extremely patient with all of their prospects down in Rockford, um, it made sense as to why they brought in a big physical veteran defenseman like Jared Tenorti. And I'll tell you what, he was a pleasant surprise all season long and performed a heck of a lot better than I had imagined when the Blackhawks first claimed him. Because looking at his past statistics, I mean, this was a guy that really had never played in more than 25, 30 games in a single NHL season. The definition of a tweener, but he earned himself, and earned is the correct word here, earned himself a one-year extension with the Blackhawks for the way that he played this season because whenever he was out there on the ice, he had, you know, uh, not the flashiest job in the world, to put it nicely, blocking shots, being physical, mostly in the defensive zone, fighting, standing up for his teammates, and he took a beating this year. Broken jaw, face lash serration, hip problem, you name it, Jared Tenori probably went through it this season, but he never quit. He never said die. And there were plenty of times where he probably could have been shut down for, you know, the rest of the season, but that's not the type of guy he wanted to be. 
if he was even slightly capable of playing, Jared Tenorti was in the lineup for the Blackhawks. And I have to give him a lot of credit for his heart, wearing it on his sleeve and just being a warrior, being a battler, being the bouncer, as I've nicknamed him, Jared, the bouncer Tenorti, because that's the role that he plays is the bouncer. If you want to go touching one of the boys, he's going to come in there and beat you up. He doesn't care if he broke his jaw four or five days ago. He's going to take a right to the face because Jared Tenorti don't say die. And I respect the hell out of it. So getting into the numbers for Jared Tenorti, lots of career highs here by the well, which is awesome to see 44 games, a career high in the NHL. And look, it was a mission for him to play in 44 total games. I mentioned Probably had over 200 stitches this year, a broken jaw, couldn't eat for three weeks, a hip problem, a groin problem, could barely walk, but was out there skating at the morning skate. Pretty incredible that Jared Snorty even got in 44 games this season. And in those 44 games, he tallied a career high two goals, career high six assists, and a career high eight points, career highs all across the board for Jared Snorty. I remember there was one game, I want to say, October or November against the Los Angeles Kings. I had an episode come out called the Jared Tenorti game. I think he scored a goal and had an assist in that game and the Blackhawks won. How about that from Jared Tenorti? I would good to see him put up, you know, career highs offensively. This side of the game is obviously not what he's ever going to be known for. He's a brute defensive defenseman that's has got some size and physicality, um, but was better offensively, better in all areas that I thought Jared Tenorti was going to get this season. Uh, averaged 16 minutes and 27 seconds of time on ice, spent most of his action on the second pairing with Connor Murphy, uh, who I accidentally skipped over his 6.3 shooting percentage this season, which almost doubled his previous career high of 3.6%. That's how uh, he wound up tailing a career best two goals. Um, but yeah, he was placed in a second pairing role for a majority of the season alongside Connor Murphy. Here's a really intriguing stat, though, for Jared Tenorti, folks. 44 games for the Blackhawks this season. Tallied 139 hits. Good for third on the team despite playing in only half the games. Uh, he was did the job that he needed to do, whether he was healthy or not. When he was in the lineup, he did it. Provided physicality in front of the net, along the boards. And especially after Jack Johnson got traded, the Blackhawks really needed that edge and size on the back end, along with Connor Murphy. So great to see Jared Tenorti step up and provide that. Uh, he also was credited with 68 block shots in his 44 games. Again, that's the stuff that's going to come with a defensive-minded role. And taking a look at his analytics, not the prettiest here. 37.0 Corsi 4 percentage. He was also on the ice for 20 goals for to 49 against in all situations. And I'll tell you what, for being a guy that played on the penalty kill and a decent role, I mean, 16 and a half minutes a night along with Connor Murphy, that's nothing to bat an eye at. Only being on the ice for 49 goals for and 44 against on this Blackhawks team for the defensive role that he played, really not that bad out of Jared Tenorti. And I honestly do think Connor Murphy was better when he was paired with Jared Tenorti this season. Um, one thing I did want to bring up before talking about the final grade, Jay Zawoski from CHGO Blackhawks brought up a great point on Twitter yesterday when responding to my Twitter poll. By the way, make sure to go and follow at Talk and Hockey on Twitter so you can vote on all of my season recaps. You can also go and follow at Lockdown Blackhawks on Instagram, at LO Blackhawks, excuse me, on Instagram. I'm going to be doing a giveaway here sometime soon, and you're going to have to follow the Instagram account in order to win anyway. So you might, might as well go ahead and get that out of the way. But what Jay Zawoski said on Twitter yesterday was, I'm assuming when you're grading or asking us for our grades of these players, you're taking the curve into consideration or the expectations we had for them coming into the year. And I did want to make sure to emphasize that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that has to go into everybody's grades, right? Because everyone has different expectations. You don't hold everyone. Well, you do hold them to the state, same standards. You understand at the same time that not everyone can play at the same level. So for example, Connor Murphy had similar analytics uh, to Jared Tenorti, but I'm going to give Jared Tenorti a B plus for his performance this season. Some of you may remember, I gave Connor Murphy a flat C for his performance this season. Well, the reason for that is I have a lot higher expectations for Connor Murphy, who's making $4 million, a veteran leader for the Blackhawks, was, you know, arguably their best defenseman just a couple of years ago. 
I have higher expectations for Connor Murphy than I do for Jared Snorty. I expect Connor Murphy to be the best or one of the best, certainly defenseman for the Chicago Blackhawks. And I just didn't think he was all that good this season. Whereas Jared Tenorti, I had no expectations for rock bottom expectations, basically. And he came in, put his head down, worked block shots, was physical, did all the, you know, non-glory jobs that come with uh, being a defensive defenseman. The expectations aren't the same for Connor Murphy and Jared Tenorti. So that's why, despite their numbers being similar in terms of analytics and when they were on the ice for goals four and yada, 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 that's why Jared Tenorti, to me, gets a B-plus because he was a lot better than I expected, put up career highs across the board, wound up playing in 44 games, which is kind of a miracle of its own. I think Jared Tenorti was awesome and well-deserving of the $1.25 million one-year extension he was given by the Blackhawks before the end of the season. And you could tell he was liked in that locker room a lot. Coach Luke Richardson spoke highly of him on numerous occasions. I was really impressed with what I saw out of Jared Tenorti. Now, I don't know if he should necessarily be in the lineup over a guy like Alex Vlasic, Wyatt Kaiser, Isaac Phillips next season, but I do think there is value in keeping him as a sixth or seventh defenseman because inevitably someone is going to go down. That's just what happens in the game of hockey. And Jared Tenorti proved this year that he's capable of filling in and being a second to third pairing NHL defenseman if the Blackhawks need him to be. All right, I think that is going to wrap up Wednesday, May 3rd's episode of Locked On Blackhawks. As always, thank you all for tuning into the show and make sure to go and follow Locked On Blackhawks for free wherever you listen to your podcasts and to go and subscribe to Locked On Blackhawks on YouTube. And that way you can get the latest episode as soon as it comes out each and every day. Once again, I'm your host, Jack Bushman. You can find me out on Twitter at Jack Bushman too, or you could also go and check out my strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey for all of the latest Blackhawks news and updates. So until tomorrow's episode, it's going to do it here for the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.